And hello folks, it's 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning, very cold here. Um, we've had our first sort of really big cold spell um, and the high will be below zero Fahrenheit, which is blah, 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 minus 15-ish um, Celsius for people in a sensible unit universe. Um, so yeah, it's a little chilly out. Good morning, Izitsu. Wonderful to see you. Not that it's morning where you live, um, but it's still wonderful to see you. Um, I'm Nick McPhee. This is Unhindered by Coding. Uh, we'll be here for two hours doing evolutionary computation in Rust, and it's likely to be an interesting day from a design perspective. Uh, we've got we've been working on recombinators and how to join them up. And uh, this is a place where um, a largely typeless language like Clojure definitely is simpler to work with because you can just grab stuff and shove it together and hope for the best um, and then have things fail at runtime and, and wonder why. But, you know, details. Um, whereas the Rust type system makes it trickier to hook up the pieces in a way that is both flexible but also leverages the tight checking um, that is one of the strengths of Rust. And we had left off with a working system that uh, had the disadvantage that we're not really using the type system to our advantage. Um, and so today we're going to poke around at seeing if we can do better, different, stronger, faster. Um, and I know Azitsu's had a lot of thoughts on this and posted actually some really interesting ideas on Discord, which is where we're going to start at least talking about those. And then we'll try a thing or two or maybe three. I don't know. We'll see what we end up doing. How, see if we can crawl from where we are to a place that we like better, um, but still understand. Uh, so let's get started. Um, so I'm going to, uh, let's get over here. So um, actually, let's say, talk a little bit about where we are. Um, where is Recombinator? There we are. And then we'll talk about where we're where we might go. So at the moment, our recombinator trait has a single method recombine that takes uh, and it's parameterized on some um, uh, type G, which is presumably the type of the genomes, um, and uh, then. Uh, so it takes a slice of genomes, uh, and these are the things to be recombined, um, uh, and a random number generator, and it returns a new genome. And the idea is that like a mutation operator might take a slice with a single genome, which isn't a great use of a slice, um, in fairness. Um, and here, let me turn this light on and see if that provides a little balance. I'm being blown away by the uh, light coming in the window there. Um, a, a crossover operator that takes two parents and generates a child might take the two parents in this and return the single child genome. And the, the main issue here is that we don't know, we're not specifying in any way how many things there are here. And so the type checker can't help us. If we want a single thing here, but we accidentally provide four, or we need two and we only provide one, the type checkers have no assistance. And all of that's going to be runtime error. And so the question is, can we turn this into a new version of the world that is um, type checked more correctly? Um, or more, let's see, type checked more usefully I guess would be the right word. And this is essentially a problem of function composition because if you think about it, we are um, 
composing functions that take varying numbers of arguments um, and we need the type system to help us out. And by using a slice or a vec would be the same thing. We're, we're flexible. We can take arbitrary numbers of arguments, but we don't, the type system can't assist us in any way um, at that point. And so the question is, can we build a recombination, uh, a function composition system that is still sort of flexible and usable, but uh, allows the type system to help us out more. Um, and I've got some thoughts, and Azitsu I know has some thoughts. Um, I'm gonna start with Azitsu's thoughts, and then uh, we'll come back to sort of what I was thinking about. So is, this is basically taking something that Azitsu posted on Discord. And actually there's an interesting idea here that I hadn't thought about um, in this example and which I think is important and something I'm going to have to make sure I keep in mind as we move forward because it's not the kind of thing that I had thought of. Um, in, um, I had usually thought of these things as like, and this is just habit, Not there's nothing magic in what I've been thinking. Um, uh, which is why I like Azitsu's example, because I think it clarifies that there's a complexity I hadn't really thought of. Um, I've been thinking about just taking um, uh, like two parents in. Um, so two parents, whoa, let's go. Parents as inputs, then uh, cross them over or recombine them in some way, and then mutate the resulting genome. Um, so that's sort of a simple example of the kind of path that we might want. And Azitsu's example is actually a little more uh, complex in an interesting way, and I think makes the composition problem a little more interesting and so I want to keep it in mind and that is um, take one parent um, there, mutate that parent so we'll call that G0 um, take another parent um, and actually let me mutate that parent, call that G1, recombine G0 and G1, we'll call that G2, and then we could, I think, uh, Izitsu doesn't have this, but just to be, um, uh, complicate things sort of in all of the ways, we could then mutate the resulting genome. And so this is interesting in some ways because here the inputs to the recombination are not just parents um, or parent genomes. They're the result of doing some additional work. And so I think I hadn't been thinking about that in my own sort of just mental cogitations on this. And that's, I think, something that I have to keep clear in my head because I, I don't actually know of a lot of people that do mutation before the recombination, but there's no reason you, sh you couldn't. And um, it might, in fact, be an interesting thing to do. So I think making sure we support it is, is useful. I don't know. I almost said important, maybe that's a little strong, but I certainly think it's useful and I would want to do that. Um, so let's actually think about Izitsu's idea here. So, um, so Izitsu has, um, let me actually copy this um, uh, bit of text from Discord which I think is useful uh, to 
understand where Izitsu's coming from, and I clearly am going to need to put some new lines in to make this work. Um, so Izitsu's imagining um, a variety of traits, selector, mutator, recombinator, and operator. So a selector would select something from the population, which we have. Mutator would take something and mutate it. Um, uh, recombinator would take two or more things and recombine them, um, uh, like crossover. And operator is the thing that kind of does the work. Um, if I'm understanding things and at any point, if anybody's got any questions, you should ask. And is it too, if you've got, if I'm just misrepresenting your, uh, proposal, you should definitely like jump in. Um, and then there would be, um, so these are sort of the nouns. You can think of these guys as the nouns. And then there would be verb uh, structs um, that would impl implement the operator trait. Um, so th this would be like, it would do the thing. It would do the selection. It would do the mutation. It would do the recombination. Um, and the operator trait would have a single method uh, that takes an input population and RNG and does what it needs to do. Um, and so he's got an example here. So we would select random. So, and if I'm understanding this correctly, so, and he, he was kind enough in discord to provide the types. So select here is of type select, not selector. So it is the verb that implements operator. Um, and, uh, it takes a random as a selector, so it knows how to select. So this select operator doesn't know anything about how it's going to select. It just knows how to respond to a request to select. And it has to take, um, when we make one, I'm guessing, um, uh, it has to, or no, I, it wouldn't be in construction. I guess this is in the call. Um, but it's going to take a selector, which tells it when you get asked to do your thing, then this is how you're going to do it. This is the kind of selection you're going to use. And we could instead pass in best or some sort of lexicase or something like that. Um, uh, and so as it's said, he was originally trying to force everything to work under the operator trait, but the composition didn't make much sense. So the, he found these wrapper structs to be useful. Um, and then, so after selection, we would mutate. And um, now here, this is a mutator, um, I'm guessing. Although, or... I guess this is a place where I get confused. I'm not sure this random presumably is the same as this random, which would make this a selector. And so I'm not sure <clears throat> what this is telling us here. Um, oh, ran oh yeah, you even say that somewhere now that I think about it. Yeah, down below in the Discord, you say that random implements both mutator and selector. Okay. So this is a mutator as well as a selector. Um, and so we mutate that selected individual. Then we select a second individual. So that's, we're, we're down in this part of the process. And we're going to select with best, followed by then mutate random. So we're taking the best individual from the population and then mutating it. And then at that point we have because of the and select somewhere we're somehow we're holding both this individual this mutated individual here and this mutated individual here and we can say then recombine um and that's uh again one of these operator implementations and it's taking um 
two point crossover as um, an argument to say, how do we recombine? So this is saying, how do we recombine? This is saying, how do we select? This is saying, how do we mutate? Um, and if we wanted um, uh, to do the mutation again at the end, we could do this and that would say, hey, um, randomly mutate the result of the recombination and we would get a new thing. So that's the proposal from Mizitsu. Um, I hope that I more or less propose, you know, laid that out sort of in a reasonable way. Um, now, so the thing I had been thinking of is quite different. And I don't know that I have a strong feeling pro or con, to be honest with you. Um, so I had envisioned something more like um, uh, a uh, well here let's enum recombinator um, and like a unary. and a binary. So I'm envisioning this as having one input genome, one output genome, and this is having two input genomes and one output genome. Um, so actually keeping track of the argument situation in the type system this way um, uh, and then, uh, you could potentially like extend this, um, uh, to have like, you know, trinary if you wanted to, um, or nary, um, which would be the idea there is that you would have arbitrary number of input genomes um, and one output genome and you would only use that if you genuinely didn't care how many inputs you got. So if you had a um, a recombinator that somehow just didn't care how many arguments it got, then you would use nary, but you wouldn't presumably try to use it um, in a case where you needed exactly two. Um, when you need exactly two, you would prefer the binary instead. And you could even, and this is sort of suggested in, in Izitsu's inclusion of selector up here, you could even have something like, <laughs> um, uh, and now the naming gets bad, but you could get um, something like selector um, that takes no arguments. Actually, maybe gene select, genome selector would be a better name. Um, a single genome. Um, and so genome selector would be similar to is it to select. You'd have to tell it what your selector was so it would know how to get the thing that it needs. Um, and, and then all of these are functions that take zero or more genomes and return a genome. Um, now, there's a problem here which is this one only works if it has access to a population. None of the others need a population. They would only need the input genomes, um, the, uh, the kind of recombinator, um, uh, and then they can make the output genome. Um, this is gonna require a population to be able to get at um, an individual from the population. And this is hinted at up here in Izitsu's thing 
um, that the operator trait would have a single method that takes an input, a population, and an RNG. So Izitsu needs the population to be an input because selection is included in the set of things that happen in the pipeline. Um, so the population would be ignored when we do things like recombine because we presumably hold all the things that we need, but it would be critical when we do selection. So there's a distinction there between those two actions um, and whether they need the population. And so that might be an argument for not including genome selector uh, might be undesirable because it, it would require that we pass in the population. Um, so, yeah. <clears throat> so I don't know if that last one <clears throat> would make any particular sense in my thinking. And then, um, and so then I guess, how do I, how do I make Izitsu's example? Um, if we have, So you're going to try a slightly different approach that passes a reference to the population as an input instead of a separate parameter. As an input, like here as an input? Is that what you're thinking? Because I, I had that thought that if you could pass the population when you... Uh, problem is when you, you'd like to build the pipeline once up at front and you don't have all the populations then um, oh as an input in the method the method in operator so you're thinking here question mark or am I just in the wrong place because this is before, this is building the pipeline and we haven't actually like told it to go. So you're thinking maybe that it would be in the, the call that says, and now do everything, perhaps. Which means you'd have to be saving closures or something yeah um so you have to like save S here you can't actually do something you just need to save the fact that you're going to do something and then when you call the operator that's when you would do it and then that's when you would pass in the population which i think actually i would like better um that would make more sense um and then it it actually makes a lot of the, then the distinction between things that use the population and things that don't, um, I think gets a little cleaner in some ways. So that's an interesting idea. I like that. Um, if we can make that work. Um, so now I got, I've been thinking about doing this now, how would I actually then join things up? And am I, is this really in some ways just a, another version of um, is it's whose thing? So I'm gonna I would need to say um, something like let um, and that allows my selectors to select from the output of a recombinator that returns multiple. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is another distinction. The Zitsu's <coughs> um, setup allows recombinators to return multiple outputs. I've done everything where my all my tools return a single genome. And there, 
it's actually pretty common in EC to have, for people to return multiple genomes. Um, so, uh, for example, if we've got parent uh, A, and let's just go with a simple binary um, bit string. Uh, like that, and we do, let's say we do two-point crossover um, uh, in the middle. I'll put a vertical bar there to indicate where the crossover is going to happen. Um, now, oh, that's will be one-point crossover because I'm just going to keep it simple. Um, so that might be a child. Um, but you often get, people often do things where you get both children. The idea being that you preserve all of the genetic material from the two parents ends up in one of the two children. So this is not an uncommon way for people to do um, crossover in evolution computation because um, they want to save all of the information. I don't tend to do that personally, but that's that's a personal inclination, not a, like, that's not based on some scientific, it's clearly better to do it my way. Um, it's just a habitual thing more than anything else. And if I want this to be used by and useful to a broad range of researchers supporting having multiple outputs. So having, for example, two children from a crossover operator wouldn't be a bad thing. Like there would be customer value, if you want to think about it that way, in going that route. And so... Um... um Yeah, so then if we have both of them, so like if this recombination returns a pair of things, we could actually like and select best child, then mutate. So this would give us two children we could select the better of those two children, mutate that child, and that would be the thing that we select or that we generate in this process. Um, oh, oh yeah, right. It would be then select. And select would be get a new thing and bring it into the system. Then select would be take the thing you got from the previous step and then act on it. Um, Right, thank you, good catch. Um, so then, the question of the moment at 10.28 is, we could just start trying to implement Izitsu's model, because I'm kind of, liking it in a lot of ways. Or I can try to think about my unary binary. Do, so let me think for a second longer about my idea and see if this is something I actually care about or whether I actually think Izitsu's model is just more flexible and would ultimately be the way I want to go. Um, If I, yeah, I, I don't know that I, if I do, if I try to do my way, I've also got, and if I want to allow operators to return multiple offspring, then my way gets really complicated because I now have uh, tight, I have to, I, I get a, um, uh, 
explosion of types because I've got all the combinations of the number of inputs and the number of outputs. So I have like one in, one out, two in, one out, two in, two out. Um, and if we get into like threes and fours, I mean, it gets particularly weird. Um, so I'm going to start to get a lot of types. Um, and I mean, maybe not that many, but I almost certainly at least double the number of types, um, in my enum. And that sounds possibly annoying. Um, hmm. And so you'd have things like, um, so genomes, so just trying to model um, so there would be that and then a if I want to mutate that I want a unary action um, which I guess is really just like like a then unary um, one over length mutator, um, would give me, so I could just have something like let first be that, and this won't be as nice as, um, is it's who's chaining, but we could make the chaining um, if we needed to, wanted to. Um, a genome selector best then unary um, mutator 0.01. So if we wanted to use a mutator with a fixed mutation rate. Of course, that would have to probably be an actual thing, not an uppercase type, but um, and then yeah I would have a binary that would take um uh So two point X O the mm, first, second, then unary one over length mutator. And I don't know that that's any better. And I still doesn't, yeah, it doesn't talk about how to deal with the population. So I don't know. I think I'm going to go with, let's see if we can make a Zitsu's plan work. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to comment all this out, but I'm going to leave it there just as notes to myself. Um, so we have so much going on. Okay. So how do we begin this process? Um, So we're in recombinate. No, we're in pipeline. Let's. Um, so we need this operator trait that's actually going to do the work. Um, and that's going to want to live probably out at the top. Um, 
Oops, no, I don't want that. Yeah, I do. New file. Um, operator. Yeah, let's just go with that. His name. Um, and so Lib's going to need to know that that's there and bring it in. Pub, pub mod operator. Okay. Um, blur. Did I put that in the wrong place? Uh, I did. I put it in bin when I wanted it in source. There we go. That's going to be better. And now operator is going to need. Actually, why is lib grumpy? Of course, you found an operator. Did I break? I think I broke Rust Analyzer again. Oh no, lib's happy now. Lib was just being slow at updating. So, um. So what we care about here is this operator. Um, and so we're going to have a trait operator and it's going to have a single function, which we could call Hmm. You do an operation or you, yeah, perform. Maybe you perform an operation, um, apply an operation. Yeah, yeah. I think that probably sounds more computery. Um, you apply an operation, it's going to take an input, a population, and actually, I assume this is going to be one of these things where we're going to have, um, where P implements population keep it general and um, and mute RNG thread RNG and that's going to return a something it's going to return so your operator returns multiple has the potential for returning multiple genomes so you would return something like vec g um, where g is a is the genome type and then the argument is going to be so the input's going to be an operator In fact, it takes an input I. I guess I don't know. I'm not sure what the input's gonna be. Is the input the thing we built by running all this together? In which case, isn't that just an operator? And our input is just self. Okay, we gotta 
import population and uh, pattern not allowed in function I thought I imported you Maybe I had not. Oh, I had not. Okay, that was the issue. Um, so the output of the previous step isn't that just going to be an operator or is it going to be something else? Um, it seems like at any point you have an operator. Otherwise, I don't know what the type of all of these things are. Um, oh, well, I guess you say things like there are these things. Um, and so these, uh, yeah, so all these composition structs and methods act on operators. So, yeah. Gotcha. Um, so in fact, let's actually, why are we grumpy? Pattern not allowed. What, what have I, um, did I lose track of my syntax there? Was the and mute over there? Yeah, it was. Okay. So we could, let's actually think about that. Um, your example of a then. So then struct then. Um, and we impl operator for then. And we have to impl apply. Boom, 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 boom. Um, now the, so then's going to take two types, where A is this okay hang on where yeah come here a implements operator I want to fill some stuff in and B oh I see is operator um, that takes in uh, so you're imagining your operators here have a type output so this is actually going to be output so we can be generic about what our operators Put. And that's where maybe the input is important because we need to know what kind of thing we've got coming in. Okay, so we need an input as well. Uh, boom. I colon input. And then down here, uh, 
And actually, now we don't need G. We just need P. Because G is no longer relevant. It got sort of subsumed by the output. And now A is going to be an operator Oh, so I is a generic, uh, sure, yeah, that, that makes more sense, actually. So I, P, so we don't have that, and then this is of type I, and in fact, I can be a little aggressive here and let's actually write some things out so that when I come back and look at this later, I will know what the heck I was thinking. Okay. And I mean, I'm going to write that out. Okay. Um, and so then is going to take one operator and come. So then is essentially our function composition. Um, composition um, takes two operators and its apply method performs the first and sends that output as the input to the second. Okay. So apply. Um, so we're going to have to construct a then. So we're going to need, so then's actually going to have to hold things. So this is actually going to be like that, and we're going to have to hold uh, fn new, and new is going to take um, first operator, second operator, and those are going to need generics, and then we'll need to store them. Uh, so we'll need to construct a then uh, with first and second, uh, which really means I didn't need all that space, but whatever. And then applying is going to look like we will take so apply, let's be explicit about the arguments here. So that's going to take self, input, input, p, population, range, mute, thread, range, output, and we're going to take <coughs> first dot apply. Well, actually, blah, we want to apply second to the result of doing first. So we ought to be able to say second dot apply. And the input to second is going to be first dot apply. And it's going to take the input, the population P. Uh, and the RNG. And then that's going to get passed to second with P and RNG. So then we have to sort out the types. 
So if then. So we need first operator some stuff, second operator some stuff. So then, hey, how you doing? Not quite an hour late, but you know. So we are, we are in some deep weedy waters. Um, just to uh, catch you up, we are trying. We're essentially doing a kind of function composition. Here, I'm gonna take this sweatshirt off. We have the heat on because it's freezing outside, and. I was expecting this room to be draftier, but the wind must be coming from the north, not the south. Um, and so it's actually kind of comfortable in here. Um, <clears throat> so we are trying to sort out <clears throat> some tricky function composition issues. Um, so we have, um, uh, we're, we're trying to build the ability to kind of pipeline together genetic operators in an evolution computation system and uh we're working with some ideas that izitsu shared on discord um where we have a variety of operators things that can do stuff we can select individuals we can mutate individuals we can recombine well genomes we can select genomes we can mutate genomes we can recombine genomes um and that there is an operator trait that everybody implements to be able to do the action. And so I'm trying to wrap my head around the types of the operator trait. So we have the operator trait takes as generic on an input type and a population type. Um, and, um, oh, oh. That actually isn't going to work, is it? I'm going to need to make that back as to be P. Um, and this is going to need to be P. Um, <clears throat> uh, so some type P that implements population, which is a trait we implemented, I don't know, ages ago. <clears throat> and an operator will have an, an associated output type, <clears throat> and it'll have a single method apply. So we apply that operator uh, and that apply is going to be given the input to the operator, the input to the function, essentially. Um, the population, in case it needs access to the population. Um, and a random number generator, because almost all of these things involve random number stuff. And it will generate an output. So that's the idea of operator. And to try to get my head around how the types are going to work. I'm looking at a then combinator, um, which takes two operators. Uh, and the idea is that, um, uh, let's see, as, as it's you said in the chat, let me actually copy that and put that here. Um, uh, uh, is it so boom. Um, so then, with two things, it's going to be an operator where um, A is the first operator and B is an operator that takes A's output as B's input. Um, so if this is um, the input type, so we need then it's going to have an input type and a P. Uh, does it need to have P? Uh, probably yes. And where P implements population. Uh, and then the first operator is going to be of type input P. And the second operator is going to be... Um, Oh, I'm going to need names for these types. Uh, so first will be operator input P. I wanted a comma at the end of that. And then second 
is going to be operator first colon colon output p and then I can do that and I'm missing a comma here population ooh that actually works um <laughs> uh those should just be a and b this will cause me many headaches do not put the bounds on the struct or the constructor oh right i always want to do that i always want to over constrain at the trait level at when really the constraining all needs to happen at the um um implementation level so in fact I think also it's true that this where p population doesn't need to be here, right? That is not relevant. Um, uh, I'll leave it at p for now. I'm not happy about that. But so then I don't want all of this. Um, I don't want all of this stuff here. I really just want. Um, input well I really I just want A and B I guess ah. and then A and B will have to be uh, operators with the right pieces when we get there um uh And so actually I want this needs to be a B and that means I need a, this right I think and this will be a this will be B and now my no P either oh yeah right thank you Ah, right. So now then doesn't have to actually have P in it. Um, okay, that's kind of nice. So then we're impl, and we're going to need to have A, B, operator. Now here I do have to provide um, the pieces for operator, right? Um, so here I, I will need all my... Um, bits and bobs uh, so a is going to be an operator which takes an input which is going to need to be a's input um, oh I guess that just means that right so it's going to have an input and p and that's going to be p commas are useful and we're going to need here we don't even need that p implements population here i don't think um but i am going to need to say what the type of input is And operator here is going to need input P, which means I'm going to need P here. Okay. Now, and this is going to be of type P. Uh, to simplify the world and this is going to be b dot output whoa oh this needs to return something up uh, in new Oh, and this would be self colon colon output. Yeah, 
Yeah, I don't care about that right now. Uh... Oh, you're right. I do want ampersand P, don't I? Good catch. I want a reference to P there. And I'm going to need a reference to P here. Um... And now we need to, if we're impling opper, we need to define output. So I need to say type output bleh, equals B colon colon output. And then this would be self dot output would be better. Ah, mismatch types expected B is blah. found unit type. Whoa. Okay, hang on. Time for cargo build. Let's look at it in the terminal because I get the formatting is better. Um Oh, I, I have that. I wonder if that's how much of the problem that is. Oh, it was maybe a lot of the problem. Okay. And so this should be self.second and self. Dot, oh, come on. First. Ah. And did that actually compile? Wow. Um, okay. So, wrap my head around things. So then, has two operators. And when we apply that operator, the, the then operator, which has its two operators, um, we are taking the second and applying it to the result of applying the first to our input, our population, and our random number generator. And second also takes the population and the random number generator. And the types of everything, which is the important point here, um, A is the first operator, B is the second operator. Um, and A takes some type input as its input and returns a colon colon output as its output. B takes a colon colon output as its input and returns B colon colon output as its output, which then becomes the output of our then operator. So our then operator takes an a colon colon in, no, it takes an input here and returns a B colon colon output there. And it then can do all the type checking to join things up. Whew. And because we have output as a separate type here, this could be a single genome or multiple genomes or a goose. And actually, <laughs> this could be important. We haven't gotten into this yet, but there are a lot of evolutionary computation systems where you have what are called certain kinds of developmental systems where you have a genome that gets translated into a phenotype. So you're going like from the RNA to the body that lives in the world and you test the body that lives in the world. That's the thing that gets scored. Um, but what you pass along you mutate, etc., is the DNA, is the genome. And this operator idea is pretty general. So it could also be used, I think, to move from genotypes to phenotypes, where the genotype could be the input and the phenotype could be the output. Um, now, it like a number of things, it takes the population when it doesn't arguably need it. Um, 
uh, but that's true for mutation and crossover as well. So, um, if we want to like cook selection into this process, um, that's probably unavoidable. Um, but yeah, interesting. So, um, uh, so that gives us the then trait. And if we go back to pipeline, then mutate is going to be an, uh, An implementation of then that takes a mutation as the second piece as a way of forcing the um, number of arguments. Um, yeah, yeah. So this would take a select random and a mutate random as our A and B. And so then mutate is going to be um, implemented in This is going to be in the operator we're going to have um, on the select, oh, and a new compose trait. Gotcha. So we'd have a co composition trait that would have things like then mutate and and select and then recombinate and it would return, they would take and return different operators with the appropriate types. So, um, uh, if we were to, um, I'm going to just hack it in here so it's all in the same place for the moment. We'll probably want to move it. So, trait compose, impl, Compose, it's going to have a bunch of stuff, but one of them is going to be this then mutate. So I want to think about what that looks like. Fun, then mutate. And compose is, let's see. Compose. is going to implement operator um, so then mutate is going to take first of type A and second of type B and return an operator Well, actually, it's going to need to act on... A will be self. Yeah, you're right. Um, so this is going to be... And self. And so really... And that's going to be an operator. And... Oh, but it, it won't be a generic operator. The point of having mutate here is that this is going to be a mutate uh, thing, which I don't have yet. So I'm going to need one of those. Oh, interesting. You can do that with a struct, but you can't do it with a um, trait. Oh, and that's, that's a, oh. 
Is that a trait or is that a struct? I don't. I'm not going to have multiple things that implement it, am I? Uh, and so let's make something quick it's called mutate. We'll have to move that. Um, Oh, you added your compose trait. So let's grab that and paste it in for everybody to see. Wah, boom. <clears throat> so compose, which has to be sized, which I assume that's relevant somewhere um so it's a trait and it will implement then mutate and it has a default implementation that returns then using our new thing and first will be self and second will be mutate new mutator so we um, then mutate is parameterized on some type M and our mutator has type M we're going to return a then with self as the first type and mutate M as the second type um, and since there's this default implementation uh, we presumably won't have to actually implement it anywhere and then uh, so we implement compose for some arbitrary type T and that'll just give us the the blank uh, the blanket Thing. Now, we're not happy about trait objects must include the dying keyword. So that is oh, and our operator doesn't have. So mutate needs to take, uh, and mutate's a trait in your world, right? Oh, it was a struct. Oh, but I do need the um, M. Uh, yeah, it's not thrilled about that, um, but we'll deal with that. That's just a warning. No, that's not a warning. That's actually an error. Um, so we're going to need to do some stuff. with that so I presume we'll need something like that and then we'll need a new oops impulse M mutate M uh, fun new takes a um, M of type M and returns first if I call it mutator um, then self mutator bum, 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 bum. mismatch types 
Oh, I need to return self. Yeah. Now, uh, private type. Private type then in public interface. Then is declared as private. Mutate M. So is the problem that this is No, I may have been part of the problem. Um, private type in public interface. So I'm going to go back to here because I think the arrows will look prettier. <coughs> it doesn't really tell me anything useful at all. Uh, <clears throat> private type mutate M in public interface. So I'm guessing that the problem is this. I should read Izitsu's comments. Just a single field called mutator M. Okay. The struct itself is not the field. The struct itself is not the field. Uh, I'm not understanding that either. And this totally, what I did there did not make this problem go away. So let me undo those things so they don't stay there since they didn't solve the problem. And let's figure out what the actual issue is. Um, hi, C Films. Wonderful to see you again. I'm glad you're doing well. I am struggling with compilation. Compilation types. They help hate me. So, okay. <clears throat> Private type. Then... So this is somehow a private type. Why is that a private type? Is the question. So if we look at, so it's telling me this is a private type. Then is a struct that's perfectly visible in this module so I don't think there's any visibility issue there it might need to be made public if we move things like compose off into their own place um, self is presumably not the problem mutate is not the problem because again that's Oh, because I made this trait public. So these other traits have to become public. Get it. I get it. I get it. I get it. So if, actually, if I took this out, it's not the right answer, but it will make the problem go away. Yes. Okay. But by saying this is pub, which I'll want anyway, that forces the then um, probably forces a whole lot of things. So this is going to need to become public and mutate is going to have to become public because that's in the um, signature and that I think, okay, yes. Is Rust more of an imperative, OOP, functional, or logical? Well, definitely not logical. Um, 
I think, I mean, it clearly has important ideas from all of the first three. Um, so I guess I would say it's not purely or simply imperative. Um, I think it's got um, the whole traits business that we're in here. I think owes a lot to object-oriented programming, but it also doesn't do things like inheritance, which can be considered sort of critical for OOP in certain circumstances. I think what we're trying to do is in some ways fairly functional. Um, so I think it, it is its own thing, but I think it's certainly got important properties from both OOP and functional. And I think that would be consistent with what the Rust developers have said about it. Um, so, okay. That does a thing. And, okay, so let me think. And I assume the size will come up later in having box dines of things would be my guess. Um, we don't really need it now. I presume I could remove it and everything would still be happy, but that when we get to pipelining, we're going to need it. Um, well, or not. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, so the, the size for values of type self. Um, so if we don't say compose is sized, we don't know how big this then struct is. That's interesting. Um, And it's, you say it's because so there's two th two things there I want to try to understand. So you had originally self colon sized on the method. I mean, is that just this? No, I didn't think so. Um, yeah, you can't put that there. So it would have to have been. Where would you even put that? Um, oh, where self-sized. Um, boom. Where... Ah! Self-sized. Okay. And so putting this, putting it here says this method requires this putting it here says anything in this uh anything in this trait is going to require it to be sized um and you say it's because of the m uh oh interesting so it's n somehow that M has to be sized. So it's inferring that. Um, uh, that M is sized to be able to put it in here, I'm guessing. But yeah, so it makes sense. I, I, I see that um, we're probably going to need this everywhere. So might as well do that. Um, and then, um, and it, am, I'm correct that we need the size to be able to make sense of the size of a then thing. Um, uh, so C films, um, I, uh, I know JavaScript. I've written actually a lot of code in JavaScript, um, more TypeScript than JavaScript, but similar. And I used to be good at C and C++ a very long time ago, but I haven't written any meaningful C or C++ code in 30, nah, 25 years. Um, so not things that I would consider, I would not be hireable in those languages at the moment. I would need to sort of catch up. Um, 
Okay. Cool. So then mutate, and then if we come back to the pipeline example, we ought to be able to have things. Let's let's actually do like and select um, uh, to make sure I'm understanding. Um, so we're going to need a function. Um, so I'm not sure I get the so. Is it too? I think you understand the the size thing here. Um, uh, the object safety rules. Oh, hey, I know I've heard of those before. Um, Rust object safety rules. Object safety. Um, a trait is object safe. Sized must not be a super trait. Well, that actually confuses me more than it helps me at the moment. Um, because it sort of says we don't want to be sized. Hmm. The dispatchable functions. Dispatchable functions not have any type parameters. Be a method that does not use self except in the type of the receiver. Have a receiver with one of these types. Does not have a where self sized bound. But that's just what we did was ha add a self sized bound. Um, explicitly non dispatchable functions have a where self sized bound. Receiver of type capital self implies this. So we presumably have a non-dispatchable function. I'm not sure I grok what that's telling us. Um, and oh, because of this parameter here, um, not have any type parameters. So that means it, it can't be a dispatchable function. So it has to be an explicitly non-dispatchable function, which means it has to have self.sized. Oh, okay. So because we have um, angle bracket M, we can't be a dispatchable function. And all associated functions must either be dispatchable or be explicitly non-dispatchable. And we fall in the explicitly non-dispatchable category. So we have to have where self-sized. Um, gotcha. Oh, well, fascinating. Now, what that doesn't do is have me, give me any understanding of what dispatchable versus non-dispatchable and object safety mean? I have seen the term object safety a number of times, and I confess I've never really looked into it enough to make any sense out of what's going on there. Because the V table doesn't have enough information for the generic M in a trait object. And the V table is the dynamic lookup um, that looks up the actual implementation of a function specified in a trait. Um, okay, well, I'm going to, I think I, I will agree, I'm going to agree with um, uh, negative Voris that this is um, a good piece of homework to do later. So I'm going to deal with that. Um, uh, 
oh, cool that you're working at McSee Films, that you're working on a new language, McFly. I like that. Um, uh, what sort of language ideas are you building into your new thing? Um, so let's see, I was going to look at and select. Um, so let's see if we can make and select fun and select. And that's going to need to take a selector. Um, and it's going to return a then self select s where select doesn't exist yet. Um, Pubstruct select s selector s impl s select uh, s a new selector s self self selector boom this will just be a then new self and selector new selector. Okay. Um, uh, <laughs> I like the time travel idea. Um, that's sort of what threads give us, right? Um, so am I more hireable as a Rust? I don't know I'm, whether I would be hireable as a Rust developer at this point. I have no idea. I don't know what the... <clears throat> the I mean, like, Izitsu, if we were in a job interview together, they would totally hire Izitsu and not me because Izitsu knows way more than I do. Um, and I think any uh, reasonable job interview would make that clear pretty quickly. Um, that said, I probably know a lot more Rust than most of the planet at this point, which is not saying anything great about me, but just there's a lot of people on the planet and most of them don't know any Rust. Most of them don't know how to program. So I don't know. I, I don't know how desperate people would be. Um, and it's not, you know, my sabbatical ends in May and then I actually go back to like working for a living uh, as a faculty member. Um, and so I'm not looking for a job as a Rust programmer, particularly. Um, but uh, in theory, uh, it could be a thing. Um, uh, oh, so I guess this was mute select, not selector. Yeah, okay. And that was my problem there. Um, but I'm probably better at Rust than C or C++. Um, and the thought of actually getting a job programming C++ makes me cry a lot. Um, so I don't see myself going down that road anytime soon. Um, okay, so we've got some composition. Um, and let's actually implement... Um, Let's implement mutate, I think, um, which is going to need to be a then. I'm in an operator, right? Um, and actually, how does that? Oh, because then doesn't at this point. Oh, we haven't applied anything. Um, aha, that's nice. Um, learn from the past, but look to the future. Um, so until we apply something, because I was, I was wondering how we never had to say that this implemented operator. But until we actually implement apply on well but we have apply
So then A needs to be an, A and B both have to be operators, and yet they are not here. There's nothing here that says that has to be an operator. And so why does it not care? Um, actually, I'm going to pull a curtain closed. The sun has come around and I can't see my screen. Doodly doodly do. Oh, that's so much better. Um, apologies. <coughs> so we know that this is going to have to implement operator at some point, but the type checker has not yet figured that out. Um, oh, sure. Then can exist without necessarily implying operator. Not all instances of then impl operator, only instances of then that have the that meet the necessary type restrictions, namely these guys right here, impl uh, operator. So if we tried to call apply on then, we would probably get ourselves in trouble. That um, these guys, if we tried to call apply on a then mutate, it would probably yell at us, is my guess. Um, so can I make that happen easily? No, not really. I was thinking I'd make, I could make a little test that we call then mutate, but I'd have to have a mutator and, uh, well, I'm going to guess maybe let's try it. CFG test, bum, 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 uh, pub mod compose tests, can't spell, um, use super star, um, test, um, fun, then mutate smoke test. And so I want to have a then mutate, which means I'm going to need to have some compose thing. Hmm. Now that's got to be a compose. That seems problematic because I oh I guess things like mutate are all gonna have to impl compose um, no because mm, I mean this has to be a compose and it has the blanket implementation for type T. Oh, gotcha. So I should be able to, if I want to make Yeah. So I ought to be able to say mutate dot then mutate and, and pass it the same. Um, yeah. Um, so we ought to, we could do that. Select new selector then mutate mutator and then we would have to define selector and mutator um 
And I can really have those be anything I want at this point. Because right now we're not doing anything with them. So um, I think I can literally just like put numbers. And oh, maybe not. Maybe. Um, so that actually, uh, that compiles but then if i try to apply something i'm going to have um uh if i try to apply combo dot apply then everything's going to blow up and apply takes um an input a population and a thread RNG an input a population and uh, what's the uh, is it this no not that Well, I don't remember how to get the current RNG. Dumb things that I ought to know. Uh, let's see, that's probably off in lib. Oh. Thread RNG. There we go. That, that's what I'm used to using. And, um, and I want to come back to your comment, Neg Borsa. We'll have to think about that. Um, so now I think we've got um, come on, die in a horrible way. Um, so, oh, don't die in a horrible way. Compiles. Compiles? But doesn't compile here? Uh, that's weird. Oh, did, did build not, um, actually compile the test code? Yeah, Bill didn't compile the test code. Um, so we can't apply, call apply on then with these things because they don't satisfy operator. Okay, so yes, we do. If we call apply, it forces us to import operator, which we don't have yet. Okay, I get that. So Neg Vorsa. Um, <coughs> So is your question like how much extra memory is the abstraction costing us um, when to use? Um, and so it's not clear what the cost of, in our case, all of these traits and things actually turns out to be. Um, if that's the the concern, I get where that's coming from. I don't share it personally. Personally, I'm generally happy to trade um, a little size or performance for correctness. Um, and uh, maintainability. Um, But my read is that the compiler is, um, uh, <laughs> yes. Okay. I, I, that ought to be on a shirt rust mental memory might be high, but actual memory is actually pretty good. Um, 
So, um, yeah, I think that my, my sense is that these things don't actually eat up that much memory. My memory footprint, I've looked at the memory footprint of some of this evolution of computation stuff. And it seems really small, like, you know, a matter of tens of megabytes. Um, ah, sure, I get, yeah. And that would be, that would be a, the case where this would matter, is if you're trying to embed stuff on um, really small architectures, then you care about that. Um, but even there, you know, it's like, um, uh, like Raspberry Pis have like stupid amounts of memory um, on tiny little things. Um, uh, so, you know, there's increasingly um, lots of memory available. Um, but, you know, that doesn't mean we should just be wasteful. Um, uh, I mean, have you actually tried stuff where it literally just wouldn't fit? Or... Um, was it you just you needed to know exactly how many bytes were being used? Um, uh, yeah. And I mean, I do think that that one thing to be careful about is that there are spaces where C++ has had a lot more time for people to develop tooling for that space. And I don't I don't know. I haven't programmed an Arduino in a decade. Um, and I don't know what the Arduino Rust space looks like, but I could totally imagine that C++ provides better, um, more mature tooling for Arduinos than Rust does, if that's not been a priority of anybody in the Rust universe to work on. Um, uh, so, I don't know. Um, uh, in some ways, this is interesting because I'm coming from the other direction. I'm used to using Clojure, um, for example, for the EC stuff, which is Clojure sitting on top of the Java virtual machine, total memory pig. Oh my God, such a huge amount of memory. Um, so like the memory pl uh, footprint of the simple GA in Rust versus... Um, Closure is it was like a factor of a thousand smaller um, in Rust, so I was just like, "Whoa, so much less memory!" Um, is that so? You know, from the direction I'm coming from, it looks like oh, a huge improvement. But yes, if you're coming up from Arduino, I could imagine that that's more of an issue. So. Um, and wow, that's uh, McFly is taking inspiration from a lot. Um, uh, and, you know, I hear people talk. I mean, I guess I would I would if in a totally uninformed way say, oh, Rust is probably very good for embedded systems. Um, uh, but it's interesting that, you know, when you're trying to actually do it, you don't find that it works well. That's, yeah, a thing. Um and uh, too bad about that. Um, so um, okay, so I want we've got we've got ten minutes. Let's see if we can impl operator for mutate. And we're gonna add a whole bunch of stuff there. Um, and so we need to, um, we need mutate M and operator is going to need input and P, um, and then that will fail by forcing us to implement a trait. So let's do that. I'm implementing a member, two members actually, we have the output. 
So the output's going to be a mutate. No, hang on. What are we doing? Output is going to be. Let me think for a second. Um, so when we apply the mutator. Yeah, probably in this instance, um, that makes sense um, because our input is say a bit string and our output is gonna also be a bit string. Um, so yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And so then our mutator is going to be doing the, the heavy lifting here. So we want, that means M is going to have to be more than just M. We're going to have to know things about M at that point, right? Um, so we have something like mutate input um, uh, and mute RNG and it would ignore the population. So that's going to be a that. Um, uh, oh, it's self dot mutator. Oh, oh, that stop it. Yeah. And now there's no uh, mutate. So we need M to actually implement um a uh m has to implement some trait mutator um which is going to have to have a mutate trait in it and i mean mutate method in it so we're going to have to have some trait uh, pub trait mutator, which is going to have to have fun mutate. It's going to take an input of type input and a range of type mute thread range, and it's going to return. Uh, hmm. So probably a bit bad, a bit bad. I don't know. We want, and then outputs a terrible name. So genome. Actually, we'll just call it G. No, we'll call it genome. Um, so we're going to take a genome as an input and return a genome as an output. Uh, so is it who says, uh, my trait has two methods, one that you need to impl that takes a mute input. Oh, interesting. And the other that is implemented at fault and takes an own value and returns it. Uh, hmm. I don't know that I want to take a mutable input though. Um, and I'll get to your question in a second, C Films. Um, because I might want to mutate the same genome many times. And if I take a mutable input, I risk actually modifying the parent genome. And that seems risky. Um, unless what you're suggesting is, okay, so maybe I'm, maybe I'm not understanding. So this is the one you have the default and you just return input, but you return it as an own value. So really, I probably wanted a reference now that I think about it, because I want 
So you do that plus this. Um, oh, and yeah, they'd have to have different names. Um, and no return. Um, just want to make things be quiet. Uh, so, so let me answer C Film's question quick and then, um, uh, we're on problem five. I don't think day five. I don't think they've been getting uniformly harder. Like four, I think was if anything easier than some of the earlier ones. But the parsing at the beginning of five was a real pain in the butt. Um, now that that's done, I think the rest of five won't be that bad. At least the rest of part one. I haven't read part two, so I don't know. But I think the rest of part one shouldn't be that hard. But the parsing for the beginning of five, but you know, five out of 25, I'm not very far in. So if they get sort of a little harder every time, you're probably not going to really notice until you're 10, 15 days in. And we're not there yet. Um, but I'm certainly enjoying it. It's been good. Um, uh, so... So this, I guess I, so I understand what's happening here. We're going to actually mutate the genome in place. Um, and here, though, I don't know that I understand what this is doing for us. Because um, it's not copying anything um so yeah i don't understand what this is accomplishing uh to be honest with you um uh, i think my inclination is more input is a reference to genome oops and a range mute thread and then we'll turn a new genome oh and i guess i we're in a trait so we just need to boom boop that that's what i'm um thinking about okay so say a crossover returns two items and i want to mutate both i would have to break apart the collection and take the values out and pass them through mutate zero that would make a needless clone though But if I have, if I have two items, I can't, there's no reason I can't call this on those two items and I don't clone anybody. Um, I just make, I just refer into those two items, make the new genomes, and then the two items presumably then get freed up because nobody needs them anymore. Um, you would need to create a new collection around them, yes. But aren't you going to need to do that in your setup as well? You can, oh, you can reuse a collection. So your, um, and all the outputs return owned types. Um, Okay, so you can reuse the little, if you're returning two things, you can reuse that little pair and not make a new VAC, for example, or tuple or whatever. 
every time you call your two point crossover. Um, okay, I see that that could be a thing. Now, mm, I think the most common case, though is going to be that we return a single thing. And so are we optimizing for a rare case versus optimizing for the common case? Um, and I still, I guess I still don't get... I'm just... Not sure I get what's going on here. Why that's there. Um, I mean, I guess we can implement it in types that implement this trait to do something different. So maybe this is just the default behavior that mutate doesn't do anything. And you get that for free in case you want it. Um, and I think you're arguing that the, the fact that we're mutating this genome isn't really a worry because everything returns an owned type. And so your, like your select returns, uh, an owned copy of the genome not a reference to the genome that's in the parent individual. So you must copy it somehow so that we have a, a copy we can then mutate moving forward. Okay. Whereas I think right now our selectors return references to gene, well, to individuals. We don't have a genome selector yet. Um, and so we don't have uh to worry about that um and i guess if i do references like this if i have a chain so let's say i did something like a dot sort of and this is by mutation turns into B, which by mutation turns into C, which by mutation turns into D. In my setup, B would make a whole new, let's say, VEC of Booleans referring to A, but it would make a whole new VEC. C would make a whole new VEC referring to B, and D would be a whole new VEC referring to C. Uh, whereas in your setup, I would only have one VEC all the way through. This VEC would be modified to become this VEC, which would be modified to become this VEC, which would be modified to become this VEC. And so I wouldn't have allocated vectors for all of those mutation steps, I would just allocate the one vector when I select. So if I say that I select A, that basically select and clone. So I make a copy of A here, but then I never make a copy later on. Whereas in my version, if I select and it's a reference, then I'm making a copy at each point. Um, so I'm going to create more vectors than your system would create. Um, hmm. Uh, we've run long and I have another meeting coming up um, and I want to grab some lunch. 
So we should probably wrap up. I clearly have to think about this some. I'm, let's see, I need to make notes. So um, this is my way, um, but may involve making more genomes in long pipelines. Um, the next two are from is it to um, and would uh, involve less copying but require that the initial select step clone the genome so that subsequent steps in the pipeline can mutate it safely. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, right. So, um, so it's really, um, uh, So it's actually the kind of apply step um, where the operator for select, when it does it, it would make the copy. Hmm. Huh. Thinking about that. Thinking about that. Now, why is it grumpy? Oh, because this requires a genome and I don't have one here. So I have to think about that. Okay, we're going to stop now. Um, so I need to, we've got a research publication deadline coming up in two weeks and we're not anywhere close. So I've got to go meet with some people and talk about how to make that happen. Um, so thank you all, as always. Awesome. Um, great feedback. Uh, and wonderful suggestions and conversation. Very much appreciated. Um, yeah, always very cool. So uh, we will return to this Tuesday morning from 10 to noon, EC and Rust. So we'll be doing this um, recombination business still. This is taking a million years, but it's been really interesting. And I've learned a lot about how to hook some complicated things up in Rust. Um, and then Wednesday, 7 to 9 p.m., and Saturday, 2 to 4 p.m., Advent of Code. We're partway through day five, part one. I'm guessing, fingers crossed, we will finish part one fairly quickly and then get on to part two of day five which as long as that initial parsing is still usable, um, maybe part two won't be too bad and we'll get through parts one and two uh, on Saturday and uh, me or Wednesday and maybe even get into part day six. I don't know. We'll see. And then, um, yeah, and then Sunday, um, uh, 10 to noon, which is what we're doing right now. Ba -doo, ba -doo. There we go. There's the schedule. So thank you all very much. It has been awesome. Um, and yeah, thank you. Is it to any time that you've spent on this is greatly appreciated. And your comments on um, Discord are wonderful. If you're interested in the Discord, uh, I think the QR code over there on the left ought to get you there. Um, <coughs> and we'd certainly love to see you. Uh, there's a Recombinators thread in the evolution computation channel <coughs> where uh, Zitsu and I have been discussing um, the composition stuff. Um, and so if you've got thoughts or just want to ask questions about what the heck we're up to, totally good. Um, thank you all very much. I will see everybody later. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your weekend, if it's still the weekend wherever you live. Goodbye!